Good morning and welcome to Grace Baptist Church. Last week I found myself at times wondering what day this is. It seems like I've lost those place markers during the week. I'm glad that we can come and meet together. Uh, This is a great time to be reminded that the church is not a building, it's made up of people. And so I'm glad that we can come and meet together even if it's online on this first day of the week, the day that Jesus Christ rose from the grave. It's good to be in a routine each day, set some goals, stay accountable with each other. One of the best uses of your time is probably to read the Bible and to spend time in prayer. So I hope you'll schedule a time to meet the Lord each day this week. Be a witness to others. Call them, write them, uh, text, uh, help someone with a need. And as you do, don't forget to give them the hope of salvation if they don't know Christ. I'd like to remind you of the members only section on our website. You'll find some prayer requests on that page. Those requests are updated continuously as people call in. There's also a new item in the members section that will allow you to give your tithes and your offerings online. If you're reading through the Bible with others in the church, this week we're reading Joshua 18 through Judges 12. That reading schedule can also be found on the website. If you didn't start in January, uh, don't give up. Uh, You can start with this week's reading. The Israelites are entering into the land of Canaan, and each tribe is being assigned their borders. I find myself looking at Bible maps as I read. Today we're praying for Bethany Thompson. Bethany grew up here at Grace Baptist Church, and the Lord called her to Brazil. She's under a lot of pressure with teachers and students out of school, and she's in need of help with translating and illustrating school curriculum into Portuguese. Bethany had planned to come back in April to visit her supporting churches, but the coronavirus pandemic has kept her there in Brazil. So let's pray for Bethany and for our other missionaries as well. Pastor Nate is coming to lead us in prayer this morning. Let's go to the Lord, shall we? Heavenly Father, we thank you uh, that we have another opportunity to come and to worship you and to think about who you are. And Lord, many of us have had extra time this week to think. And Lord, as we consider uh, who you are and who we are in relation to you, Lord, may we be encouraged. May we be, in some cases, rebuked when needed. Uh, May we see uh, that you are sovereign over everything. And Lord, as we see the uncertainty of our times, Lord, help us to remember that you are always with us. And uh, Lord, that you are giving grace on a daily basis. Uh, to go through some of these uncertainties. And so, Lord, help us to trust you. Help us to rely on you. Lord, we thank you that we can have a bedrock of truth through your word. Lord, that even this morning as the word will be opened, I pray that you would help us to set aside distractions. Help us to focus on what you would have us to learn. Help us to be different um, and, and to be able to see and to, to understand what you would have us to know today. Lord, we thank you that we have the opportunity to uh, have an impact around the world. Lord, I think especially of Bethany Thompson and our missionaries uh, all around the world, but especially Bethany this morning. We want to bring her uh, to the throne of grace this morning, and I pray that you would help her as she is um, seeking to uh, put out or to lay out the curriculum, and I pray that it would be a blessing to many Brazilian children and, and then also their families as well. And Lord, we thank you that we, as we give of our tithes and our offerings, we have the opportunity to play a part in that. And so, Lord, I pray that through all that is said and done this morning, that you would get all the praise, you would get all the glory. And it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.
Our scripture reading this morning is found in Psalm 119, beginning in verse 97 through 104. And if you are if you are able, we'd like to have you stand to honor God's word as Israel did as a group, and follow along as we read Psalm 119, 97 to 104. Oh, how I love thy law! It is medit- my meditation all the day. Thou, through thy commandments, has made me wiser than mine enemies, for they are ever with me. I have more understanding than all my teachers, for thy testimonies are my meditation. I understand more than the ancients, because I keep thy precepts. I have refrained my feet from every evil way that I might keep thy word. I have not departed from thy judgments, for thou hast taught me. How sweet are thy words unto my taste, yea, sweeter than honey to my mouth. Through thy precepts I get understanding, therefore I hate every false way. May the Lord bless the reading of his word to our hearts this morning. Thank you. You may be seated. Jesus fair was pierced by thorns, by thorns grown from the fall. Thus he who gave the curse was torn to end that curse for all. O love divine, O matchless grace, that God should die for man. With joyful grief I lift my praise, abhorring all my sin, adoring only Him. My Jesus meek was scorned by man, my man. sin he prayed for them for me my jesus kind was torn by nails by nails of cruel man and to his cross as grace prevailed god pin my wretched sin Love divine, O oh matchless grace, that God should die for man. With joyful grief I lift my praise, abhorring all my sin, adoring only Him. My Jesus pure was crushed by God, by God in judgment trust. The Father grieved, yet turned his rod on Christ, made sin for us. My Jesus strong shall come to reign, to reign in majesty. The Lamb arose, and death is slain. Lord, come in victory. O love divine, O matchless grace, that God should die for man. With joyful grief I lift my Please open your Bibles to Acts chapter 2, Acts chapter 2. Last week we looked at the sermon that Peter 
preached at Pentecost in verses 14 through 36 of this chapter, and we saw how the elements of that sermon provided a template for good preaching. Whether you are delivering a sermon or listening to one, you need to look for these elements. What makes a good sermon? Good preaching is based on the Bible. Peter explained what they were seeing at Pentecost by quoting scripture and making the right application. There are three questions that every sermon should answer. What does the passage say? What does the passage mean? And how does it apply? And Peter's sermon answered each of those questions. He reminded them of the Old Testament prophecy of Joel 2, found in verses 28 through 32. And he told them, verse 16, This is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. What you're witnessing at Pentecost, Peter was saying, is exactly what Joel said would happen. Good preaching is based on the Bible. Secondly, good preaching tells people how to be saved. The words of Joel ended with the message of salvation, and that verse, verse 32, is quoted in Acts 2.21. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. What a tragedy for unsaved people to go to a church service and never hear the gospel. There are three words at the end of Ruth chapter 1 that Naomi uses, and may it never be the words that people use when they leave our church. Those words are home again empty. Jesus saves. That's what the lost people need to hear. Acts 4.12 says, Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Jesus saves. That's what those who claim Christ need to hear. 1 Corinthians 1.18 says, For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved it is the power of God. Good preaching tells people how to be saved. Good preaching makes a point. There's a theme. Peter, in his sermon, gave three proofs that Jesus was the Messiah. First, the miracles that had been done among them proved that Jesus was the chosen one of God, the Messiah, the Christ. Second, the resurrection that they had witnessed also proved that Jesus was the Messiah. Third, what they were witnessing that day at Pentecost proved that he was indeed the Messiah. They were seeing the fulfillment of the promised Holy Spirit of God, the one whom Jesus sent as another comforter, the one who would, fulfill, full, who would fill the disciples and empower them to take the gospel to the ends of the earth. Jesus was indeed the chosen Messiah of God. Good preaching makes a point. Peter did that in the Sermon at Pentecost. Fourth, good preaching calls men to repentance. Peter clearly and boldly places the responsibility of Jesus' death on them. He didn't hold back from saying what needed to be said. Look back in Acts 2, verse 23. He being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, ye have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain. And just to make the point even further, in verse 36, he says, Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God... Who hath made that same Jesus whom ye crucified, both Lord and Christ. And with that, Peter finished his sermon. Now watch how God works during the invitation. These elements of good preaching are all our preparations, but God is the one who must work, and he certainly did at Pentecost. Evangelist Billy Martin used to tell about building a fire in the fireplace when he was a boy. He would bring in the wood and set up the smaller kindling pieces under the larger pieces of wood and put some paper under it all. But his father always told him, I'll light the fire. And he said that's the best advice to anyone who teaches and preaches God's word. Do all the preparation that you can, but depend on God to light the fire. I've been to too many meetings where no one moves during the invitation except perhaps one who wants to leave early and be the first one out the door. I've been in a few services that have lasted until midnight 
And people kept coming forward to confess their sins and make things right with God. We must depend on God to light the fire. And so the title of the message today, the response to Peter's sermon in Acts chapter 2, verses 37 to 41. First, they were convicted by what they heard and knew something had to be done. Verse 37. And when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Notice, first of all, they heard. When they heard this. I mentioned last week that preaching must be heard in order to be effective. That seems a simplistic point. But Romans 10, 14 says, How shall they believe on him in whom they have not heard? Preaching must be heard. There's another passage that shows the problem of hearing. Paul told Timothy in 2 Timothy 4 that in the last days, people would not endure sound doctrine. Instead, they would run from one voice to another because they wanted to have their ears tickled with some pleasant topics. They would rather go home feeling good about themselves than realizing that there was sin in their lives. 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 2 through 4 Paul tells Timothy, preach the word, be instant, in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long-suffering and doctrine, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lusts shall they heap to themselves teachers, having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. Notice it's not the teachers that have the itching ears here, it's the listeners They're not willing to listen, to endure sound doctrine. They want something new that will make them feel good. By the way, there are many modern churches today who are catering to those with itching ears. We're not to go around taking a poll to find out what people want to hear in the message on Sunday morning. God has already mandated what we need. He's told us what we need. It's consistent. Accurate preaching of the doctrines of the scripture. They'll turn away from the truth. First, uh, 2 Timothy 4, verse 4. They'll make a willful decision to turn from the truth of God. And what do they turn to? They turn to stories, fiction. When Egypt sold the treasures in Jerusalem, or stole the tre- treasures in Jerusalem, Rehoboam substituted shields of brass for Solomon's shields of gold. May we not be guilty of substituting any inferior brass philosophies of the world for the gold of God's word. They heard. They were convicted. It says they were pricked in their heart. The word here is katanuso. It's the only time this word is used in the New Testament. Nuso, the second half of that word, is used in John 19.34 to describe the soldiers who took a spear and pierced the side of Jesus on the cross. That piercing was nuso. Here, kata is is added as a prefix. These men were pierced down to the heart. The Holy Spirit was already doing the work that Jesus said he would do in John chapter 16 and verse 8. And when he has come, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. God's Holy Spirit still convicts people of sin. You may be listening right now to the word of God. A thought comes to you as you apply that truth to your own life. As you're honest with yourself in the sight of God, you know something needs to change. That's how the Holy Spirit works. Hebrews 4, 12 and 13, for the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing, it's a different word for piercing here, it means to penetrate, to reach through, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight, but all things are naked and open unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. When we listen to what God has to say, and the Holy Spirit starts applying that truth to our lives, we too are pierced to the heart. 
There's conviction. They heard, they were convicted. Then they asked a question, what shall we do? Reminded of the jailer at Philippi who fell on his knees before Paul and Silas when God opened the prison doors. And he asked, sirs, what must I do to be saved? They said, believe. And he did. The ruler in Luke 18 asked, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus knew all about him. He knew his heart. He knew he was living for himself, and money was his God. And so Jesus said, sell all you have and follow me. And the ruler thought and said, that's too great a price. I think I'd rather have my wealth than have my sins forgiven. Not everyone who asks the right question is going to follow through and trust Christ. These men, after hearing Peter's sermon, asked, what shall we do? They asked because of the power of the word of God and the work of the spirit of God. This was the intended response of the sermon. Good preaching brings men to a decision. What shall we do? How can we respond to what we have just heard in God's word? They asked Peter and the apostles. These men had the answers. Do you? If someone asks you what they should do to come to Christ, are you ready to tell them? Do you have some Bible verses ready? When you're ready and praying and filled with the Holy Spirit of God, he'll bring people across your path who are asking the question, what should I do? And you can be ready to tell them. Second, in verse 38, Peter revealed to them their greatest need. Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. The answer Peter reveals is very clear, very simple. First, repentance. There must be repentance for salvation. Some have argued that a person can be saved without repenting. All they have to do is is have faith. All you have to do is believe, they say. Jesus said in Mark 2.17, I came not to call the righteous but sinners to repentance. And in Luke 13.3, he said, Except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. In Luke 15.7, he said, There will be joy in heaven over one sinner that repenteth, more than over ninety and nine just persons which need no repentance. And in Luke 24, 46 and 7, he said, Thus it is written, and thus it behooved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations beginning at Jerusalem. Repentance is part of the gospel message. You can't be saved without repenting of sin. I remember talking to a woman one time who said, I want to be saved. And I said, are you willing to confess your sin and let God forgive you? And she said, no, I don't want to give up my sin. I just want to be saved. Well, salvation includes repentance with God's forgiveness, forsaking your sin, and turning to Christ. Faith and repentance go hand in hand. Faith is a belief that Jesus Christ is the Son of God who died for my sin. He was buried and he rose again. That's faith. Repentance is a change of mind that affects the way that you live. I think it's best illustrated, the meaning of the word repent, in Matthew 21, 28. But what think ye? A certain man had two sons, and he came to the first and said, Son, go go work today in my vineyard. He answered and said, I will not. But afterward he repented and went. When you repent... You change your mind about Christ. You change your mind about your sin. You stop relying on your own good works and you trust his plan of forgiveness. And that salvation changes the way that you live. Second, we see in this verse baptism. Peter said, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. This verse is not teaching that a person must be baptized to be saved. As a false doctrine known as baptismal regeneration. Say, so how do we know? Well, let me give you some points. The, argu- the, the grammar argues the point. In the Greek language, verbs are very specific. They have person, number, and tense. 
And in Acts 2.38, repent is in the first person plural. Ye, all of you, must repent. Be baptized is in the first person singular. You, as an individual, so he's saying you all need to be repent you all need to repent to be saved and when you do that then you need to individually follow the Lord in believers baptism. The theology of salvation by faith without works also argues the point. The verse can't be talking about baptism being necessary for salvation that would make it a work something that we do. The Bible clearly says in Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. The historical context of baptism argues the point. When a Gentile wanted to join the synagogue and follow the God of Israel, he would be baptized. Peter is telling them that, All of you, Jews and Gentiles, need to repent and then give evidence of faith and obedience to Christ through baptism. This is baptism after faith in Christ, after salvation. So Peter is not saying you have to be baptized in order to be saved. He is saying that baptism is an important part of obedience. He's saying repent for the remission of sins and be baptized. Homer Kent writes, the New Testament always assumes that a true Christian will obey the Lord and be baptized. Baptism is that outward sign of salvation, something that's already taken place in your heart through repentance. Notice also we see a reception of the Holy Spirit. While baptism is the external evidence of salvation to others, The reception of the Holy Spirit is an internal seal of salvation, a testimony to yourself. Romans 8.16 says, The Spirit himself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God, and the Holy Spirit will give you that assurance that that you belong to God. The answer Peter gives is clear and simple. The promise Peter reminds them of is universal. We see that in verse 39. It tells us who can be saved. For the promise is unto you and to your children and to all that are afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. You and your children here would be the Jews. They were the ones to whom Peter was reaching in this sermon. They were the ones in Jerusalem for the Passover feast. And then all that are afar off, that looks toward the Gentiles, who in the future would trust Christ and be saved. And then third, as many as the Lord our God shall call. God is the one who calls men to salvation. Romans 8.30, Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called. And whom he called, them he also justified. And whom he justified, them he also glorified. God calls man to be saved. But you know what? Man must call on God to be saved as well. Romans 10, 13, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. The door of salvation is open to everyone who will come. Notice in verses 40 and 41 now, they received the word and trusted Christ. We have Peter's persuasive invitation in verse 40. And with many other words did he testify and exhort, saying, Save yourselves from this untoward generation. Then they that gladly received the word were baptized, and the same day were added unto them about 3,000 souls. Peter used many words. When God is working in a service, it never seems to be that long, does it? You say, well, just say something more. Just continue preaching. It's funny that preachers are the only people I know that don't get paid for overtime. And with many other words, what did he do with those other words? He did testify and exhort. There were words of testimony. The word testimony here is a charge. Paul uses it three times in the pastoral epistles. It's a serious charge. So he's charging them with these words. There are also words of exhortation. There it's parakaleo, to be called alongside of. It's a compassionate call. 
It's an urgent call. It's a compassionate call. He called them alongside. He encouraged them to make a decision. Notice also their words of salvation. Save yourselves. God does the saving. But every individual has to respond to his invitation. God has thrown out the lifeline. You must take hold of the rope. There's an individual responsibility to believe. Save yourselves. Save yourselves from what? From this untoward generation. The word untoward is skolios in in the Greek. A crooked generation. A generation that's crooked can't measure the truth accurately. They measure morality and righteousness with a crooked standard. They're in error. And if you do not accept salvation, you'll go down with the rest of the world to an eternal destruction. Save yourselves from that kind of an end. In verse 41, we find the people's response to the invitation. I love the order that's in this verse. It's very important. Then they that gladly received his word were baptized, and the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. They received the word. Notice they received it gladly. Not all, but they who did receive the word did it with gladness. They followed in obedience. Now there's joy in salvation. The burden of sin and of guilt is finally lifted. The certainty of heaven is yours. In Luke 14, the parable of three lost things, after the lost sheep, the words are, there, was, there is joy in heaven over one sinner that repents. The second part of the parable is a coin that's found. And there, the writer says, there's joy in the presence of the angels of God. So if there's joy in heaven and there's joy in the presence of the angels, that indicates that God himself is rejoicing. He's the one that's in their presence. The third part of the story is the son who was once lost and is found. And that's the reason for the whole story. There's joy over someone who's lost who is finally found. Salvation brings joy. They received the word gladly. In John Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress, when Pilgrim came to the Savior, he felt his enormous burden lifted from his back, and he saw it running down the steep place into an open sepulcher. And Pilgrim began singing a new song, Blessed cross, blessed sepulcher, blessed rather be the one who was there put to shame for me. They received the word gladly. Then... They were baptized. Again, an outward sign of their obedience to Christ, a testimony to others of their identification and salvation with him in his death, his burial, his resurrection. Third, they were added unto them. This is a uniting of a local body of believers. For those who don't think church membership is important, notice what's taking place on the day the church was born, Pentecost, the same day, that were added unto them. Homer Kent writes, this whole paragraph, verses 41 to 47, emphasizes the visible relationships of the believers. Hence, were added should be understood of their addition to the group of Christians, not of their mystical addition to the Lord. He says it's a local assembly here that they were added to. How many were in that assembly? About 3,000 souls. What a glorious beginning of the church. Whenever the word of God is opened, the spirit of God is at work, there will be a response. I wonder today, as you've heard the word of God, is the spirit of God working in your heart? Have you responded in faith and have your sins forgiven? I urge you, respond to God's invitation of salvation today. He died for you. He invites you to trust him as your Lord and Savior. Maybe you're a believer. Are you giving out the good news of salvation? Are you prepared as the apostles were to say what needed to be said? The gospel is the only answer to man's greatest need. 
Don't get sidetracked with things that really don't matter for eternity. Gary's going to close the service with an invitation. If you want to respond in faith, opening your heart to Christ, trusting him as your Savior, repenting of your sin, I invite you to pray right where you are. Confess your sin. Believe in Christ. Ask Jesus Christ to save you. And if you do that, would you tell someone else so that they can rejoice with you?